I want to share today with you something I'm dubbing the V pipeline. For me, this is stepping outside my comfort zone a little bit. Uh, and what I'll say is that it's not a complete uh, product, right? It's going to be for free. The link is going to be down below on GitHub. But what it's really going to be, it's going to be a Blender add-on. Uh, it's also going to be a geometry node setup and an Uber shader, right? So uh, for those of you who don't know, the idea behind an Uber shader is that it's a big shader that you can apply to as many objects as you can in your game. And the reason we do this is that it has performance benefits, but there's kind of a second side to it that I'm also exploring and that it causes you to have some sort of constraints in your game. Uh, and those constraints can actually improve your design. So before I actually show what the pipeline does, how it works, I'm actually gonna show you what the inspirations were for this pipeline. So there was a GDC talk that I saw given by this guy here, his name is Tor Frick, and he's on a development team that did The Ascent. Um, so I actually haven't played this game, but I had seen some gameplay, seen some screenshots, uh, and the art looks incredible. So let's watch this for a little bit, and then maybe we'll talk about um, how this inspired me to work on this pipeline. We needed to find a way of doing this with as little to no work. We also needed a lot of variety. For example, how do we even have colors? So we can't just use one color per asset because that's boring, and uh, several materials are out of the question. So you know, how about we just use a mask for different textures or like uh, different colors? That, that would mean creating thousands of textures and that would just, you know, just adding them in per force would be a, you know, a giant pain in the ass and you know, we don't have time for that. We essentially use the UV sets for the, uh, for the meshes and then we just basically use the UDIM approach where we just offset the UVs and use that as a mask. And that way we could just uh, have different colors without having any, any textures. The primary materials we needed in the game was, you know, because it's hard surface. So it's either, you know, bare or painted metal or sometimes plastic, you know, when we're going a bit crazy. Uh, and the main shading difference is basically, you know, either metal or non-metals. Right? And, uh, and now that we have those basic in place, we could focus on adding, adding rust, dirt and other effects in, you know, a decently believable way. So we ended up experimenting and adding like several layers. So first of all, I mean, we're using a trim sheet, so it's very easy to just ask, you know, to, to add some texture masks that can drive things like details around bolts and like, you know, very fine detail like uh, dirt and wear and tear and so on. It gives you a little bit of a base pass, right? But it doesn't give you any, any contextual dirt. It doesn't use the shapes of the mesh. You know, you want, you want dirt behind some pipes. You want dirt in some little hatch. You want some scratched metal on the exposed parts of a mech. So we still can't use textures. So we just use vertex colors. So we bake down the ambient occlusion and the convexity, and we use that to drive dirt, wear and tear, and rust, just in like a, in a generalized way. We, uh, when you bake light in uh, in Unreal, you can use the option to also bake out an ambient occlusion mask. So that's what we use to just drive like the third aspect of of the dirt. So so assets that are next to each other are actually getting like the like dirt, you know, under the crates, behind some pipe meshes, things like that. So. You know, we we'll swap back and forth. You can see some of the, you know, some of the objects like they're in the background, for example. But even with you know this, we you know it's it's still sci-fi. We need glowy bits. We need decals. We used a secondary UV set, and then we used the same approach with the UDIMs to just mask between decals and emissive surfaces. So when I saw this the first time, I was pretty blown away, honestly. Um, the presentation is really good. The visuals are awesome. Um, but it really got me thinking about a few things about, you know, my own pipelines that I've used and different games I've made. Um, for instance, he, he talks about multiple materials and he's basically just saying, no, we're not going to do that. So right away, I know that they're going to use some kind of Uber shader. And then I can tell, like, these are tech art guys, you know, obviously they have a lot of artistic vision and the art direction is also really good, but they're really focused on the technical. So that fascinated the hell out of me. The second thing he mentioned was about UDIMs and how you can use UDIMs to basically put them in different locations on that UDIM grid and use that to drive different colors. Now I experimented with this for a while and honestly it was just not working. So GLTF is the main uh, export 
import feature that I use to get my models out of Blender and into Godot in my case, but it could be Unreal, it doesn't matter. Um, the problem is, is that the UDIM information is actually not stored anywhere. The way that these guys are using UDIMs is really smart because they're bringing that information into Unreal and then actually creating like a different color palette based on where the, the actual polygon sits in the UDIM grid. Uh, he mentioned trim sheets, which I'm a huge fan of and have been wanting to experiment more with. So I kind of went down that road of, of doing my own trim sheets. Um, and then, of course, we get to vertex colors. The idea that we're going to pack all this information in vertex colors. They talk about ambient occlusion. That one's not too complicated. And then they talk about convexity. So I spent a while. I was spinning my wheels on convexity, actually, for a couple weeks. Um, but I did discover how to do it in Blender. Really, what we're talking about with convexity is we're talking about curvature, right? How, what's the, can you bake a texture or can you bake some map that shows the curvature of the, of the object? And in Blender, this is called pointiness. So let's talk about the second influence that uh, really got me on this path. There's a game, it's out now, it's called Caravan Sandwich. Um, so yeah, let's just watch the trailer and then I want to talk about some of the technical details on how they actually established the colors in the game. It's the first game from our small indie studio releases today. It's a small and cozy open world game where you travel with your van on a mysterious planet to find your lost sister. It has no combat, no death, no timers. Go check it out and tell me if you like it. But I look at these games and I can tell there's clearly some good, there's people who understand color, they understand composition, some really interesting things. So I stumbled upon this post where the dev says, so this flag is actually not a texture. Can you guess why? With a you know cheeky little emoji here. Um, I look at this and I'm instantly thinking, oh, well, it has to be vertex colors, right? Um, the interesting thing you'll note about it is that most of the time when you look at vertex painting, it has this kind of really blurred effect. So you can read through the comments on this post as well. But basically, you know, what's happening when there's that blurred effect is that the vertex color data is shared. So if you had a vertex here, kind of where my mouse is now, and you put a particular color in there, in the fragment shader that's actually rendering these quads on the screen, it's going to be like linearly interpolating that color between the other vert vertices. And that's why you get this blurred effect. And I didn't know how they actually did this. Um, they achieved this using a, you know, a, a thing in Blender, it's fairly new, called face corner vertex colors. Over here in Blender, as you can imagine, I'm going to be using a whole bunch of uh, vertex colors and they are face corner colors. What face corner colors allow you to do is have really sharp transitions of the colors in your model. And you don't need super detailed models. Like for instance, this is the, what the polygons look like on this model. They're not too crazy, right? Um, and actually we can flip through here and see the different, different uh, channels that I'm using on, you know, these are just all baked vertex colors. But yeah, you get those really sharp transitions between colors, which you don't need to have a super high poly count. You can just color your model, you know, and clearly with games like Caravan Sandwich, if you have a good idea of what kind of color palette you want to use and how you want to compose these scenes, it will look really good. Um, so I will heavily stress <laughs> that this video is not to say that this piece I worked on here is even good, right? I, I don't think it is. And in fact, I think I've done better hard surface work myself. Um, I just wanted to throw it together as a proof of concept. That's it for part one. Um, in the next one, we're going to dive into the details of this pipeline. We're going to talk about how to use the different vertex colors. We're going to talk about trim sheets and mapping the UVs to those trim sheets. We're going to use this add-on. And then finally, I'm going to talk through how this whole geometry node setup works. How do we map all those colors into like a single channel? So for instance, we have the color data. All of the color data is mapped to just the red channel of the vertex colors. All of the metal roughness pairs are mapped to the green channel. We're gonna do ambient occlusion on the blue channel, and then we're gonna play around with some edge masking uh, on the alpha channel, right? So all of these channels get packed up into a single vertex color set. That gets packaged over and sent into Godot. And then finally, we have this Uber shader that kind of parses it all. So I hope you stick around for the, the next one. I think it's gonna be really good. And I hope it really encourages people to play around with it. So as I mentioned, the link for the GitHub is below. Right now it's pretty bare bones. There's just the Blender tools, which just has that .blend file that I was working on. It has the trim sheet, the scratches, as well as the Python add-on. And then it has the, the Godot project itself, which should open on Godot 4.3. 
So thanks for sticking around and watching. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope to see you all again in part two.